Good morning, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, our event today has live interpretation in French, Portuguese and Spanish. To access the interpretation, please click on the interpretation button on the lower side of the right section of your Zoom screen and select the language in which uh, you would like to take part. I want to thank our interpreters today. They make uh, this inclusion process possible. Thank you very much for always being with us. Uh, FOS Feminista is a feminist alliance of activists, coalitions, movements, and organizations that work together to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights and justice for women, girls, and gender diverse people uh, worldwide. I am so very pleased to be with you today to launch the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Index, which we created in partnership with the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University as a tool to assess the US government work on SRHR and hold it accountable to its commitments. The index uh, annually grades uh, US government actors across three main domains that represent core funding streams for US global health assistance. Those are family planning, um, um, maternal and child health, and HIV AIDS. So you, you're probably wondering what is our role in, in, monitoring, in monitoring government accountability. In, in the world of sexual and reproductive health uh, advocacy, we challenge decisions that restrict rights. We push for laws and policies that re respond to people's uh, lived experiences and needs. But when it comes to really guaranteeing access for women, girls, and gender diverse people, which is our ultimate goal, we know that accountability is the crucial step. And that is why FOS Feminista has long been committed to development, to development accountability strategies and tools that can bridge the gap be, between what governments say and what they actually do. In that sense, we have, for example, the almost 10 year old experience of uh, the Montevideo Consensus, the follow up of the Montevideo Consensus, a tool called Mira Que Te Mira, or in English, Look, We Are Watching. It's a regional initiative for social monitoring of the commitments uh, adopted by Latin American and the Caribbean governments in the 2013 Montevideo Consensus, which is considered a historic sexual and reproductive health and rights consensus in the UN system. Uh, what monitoring strategies like the index and Mira Que Te Miro uh, aim to do is to create the conditions for an open and continuous dialogue between civil society and governments. We demand transparency around policies, budgets, data, and this allows us to establish a proactive framework for discussing what must be done, how, and, and when. Otherwise, all the beautiful language uh, we work so hard to get in so many decision-making spa spaces is just that, uh, words uh, on paper. Our hope with the index is to connect organizations, groups, and activists who are working to hold the US government accountable through reliable, consistent data that can support our demands for sexual and reproductive health and rights, policy implementation, and access. Particularly, we, need, we feel we need more uh, and more of the groups directly impacted by US global policies in this conversation. So when we present in a little bit our 2020-2021 data, uh, please consider it as an invitation to learn, improve, uh, and demand together. Uh, perhaps in your minds, there is the question of why does assessing US uh, global health assistance on SRHR matters for global and reproductive justice? You know, as you know, the, the US is uh, the world's largest donors for global health. Decades of experience and research on the Helms Amendment and the Global Guard Rule have shown how the US has used its power restricting access to SRHI by, by imposing um, very dogmatic fundamentalist views on, on women, girls, and gender diverse people most impacted by these inequalities. Uh, the Global Guard Rule is a ban on granting US global health assistance to foreign organizations involved in any way with abortion care even if they use their own funding, or even if the law of the land uh, allows. So since the 80s, uh, it has been cyclically imposed and revoked, creating a structural damage to women, girls, gender diverse people, and to civil society organizations in the global south uh, by really dismantling networks of uh, services, uh, healthcare services, including access to contraceptives, sexual information and education about unwanted pregnancy. 
uh, pregnancies. The end result, and research is very clear about this, is that while the global gap rule was in place, women in sub-Saharan Africa were twice as likely to have an abortion, and as in Latin America, three times more likely to have an abortion. Of course, there is nothing accidental about which bodies and lives are most impacted by US global health assistance and its most oppressive versions like the global gap rule. We are talking about global south, poor, black, brown, young and indigenous uh, peoples whose life projects are being disrupted as a result of these systems of, of oppression. Even when the directions of the US global health assistance are more progressive, any meaningful transformation is only sustainable with civil society continuous accountability efforts. In fact, FOSS has recently launched a different accountability strategy that provides yet another example of how progress on words, whether it's law policies, um, it's only the first step and it's often up to civil society to um, not to allow to end it there. Our report called uh, chaos continues, the strengths and pitfalls of the 2021 global gag rule revocation showed that although the latest version of the global gag rule was revoked in January of 2021, eight months later, many foreign organizations that are recipients of US global assistance were still not sure what that meant. Uh, the lack of clear communication and guidance by the US government caused at least eight months of delay in restricting in restoring abortion access uh, for people legally entitled to do to do to receive it in countries like Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, Fos Feminista, the creator of the index, uh, as changed back then, is a global South-led international alliance, uh, and as such, we believe that global South leadership and engagement is central for challenging and dismantling uh, the monopoly of power that the U.S. has on the sexual and reproductive health and rights ecosystem, interna international decision-making and funding. This, is, uh, this monopoly is a product of more than a century uh, of policies that have led the US uh, to be them as the moral compass for the rest of the world. Uh, while the Hems amendments and the global government have long shown uh, that uh, the fundamental failures of this compass, uh, we, are now, we are now also living at, at perhaps a historical time when we need um, multi-directional south-south, south-north, transnational activism and solidarity uh, is very evident to us. Uh, with the Supreme Court uh, decision on Dobbs, um, the US has joined a handful of countries, sadly, that have backtracked on abortion rights over the last decades. El Salvador, Honduras, Iran, Nicaragua, Poland, Meanwhile, the green wave in Latin America and the Caribbean has been making great advances in Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, uh, and abortion rights tied can be seen in Africa uh, too, Mozambique, Kenya, Sierra Leone. Fosfa Vinista believes that we need to monitor and assess the US global health assistance on SRHR from the perspective and knowledge of the global South, long-term resistance to anti-gender anti authoritarianism. In transnational accountability effort, there is a lot to be learned from the experience of those who have been dedicated to expanding access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, including safe abortion care, under very difficult, restrictive, and oppressive uh, circumstances. The index is, in that sense, an opportunity to connect international feminist organizations and other organizations in a multi-directional accountability exercise that brings diverse participation participation to the task of holding the US accountable to human rights, while also seeking to, seeking to inspire other regional and national accountability initiatives. Thank you again for joining us. I so look forward to this presentation and to the conversation and to the work together. Thank you very much. Well, before I jump in, I am so excited about what's happening in the chat. It's so great to see so many old friends and new friends uh, chatting together. I am so thrilled to be able to talk to you all about the SRHR index. My name is Bergen Cooper. I am the director of policy research with Fos Feminista, and I would like to give you a brief overview of our methodology, discuss some of the trends that we have seen over the past six years of grades across three administrations and of course, unveil the 2020 and 2021 SRHR index grades. 
My colleague, Sammy Luffy, will be sharing relevant portions of the SRHR index while I speak with you. Uh, I'd like to thank Sammy, the technical lead on the SRHR index. She's done an extraordinary job of scoring the index, working with an absolutely brilliant team of Fos Feminista staff, consultants, interns, uh, many of whom you are chatting with in the chat right now, including uh, Dikshita, Dikshita Ramanarayan and Jillian Montilla and Liana Baleke Ashete. I want to thank them all for their extraordinary work on this index. As, as Giselle so eloquently explained, the SRHR index, it's a tool to hold the U.S. government officials accountable for their actions related to global health while outlining clear, realistic, and achievable recommendations to promote sexual and reproductive health and rights through U.S. global health assistance. And now you're seeing the index. So we created the SRHR index in partnership with the Global Women's Institute at the George Washington University. And we first released the set of grades in 2018 for calendar years 2016 and 2017. So the SRHR index evaluates the performance of actors working in US global health assistance. So this includes the White House, Congress, Department of State, USAID, Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Defense. We chose these actors because of their prominent role in global health assistance. So for each actor, we only grade them in the domains in which they work, family planning, maternal and child health, and or HIV and AIDS. Some actors like the White House uh, receive grades in all three domains, while other actors like Department of Defense, they only work within one domain. We chose these domains because they represent the core funding streams of US global health assistance and because they mirror the silos in which the US government structures its global health programs. So these selected domains, they shouldn't be interpreted as what's important in global SRHR, rather they're what is funded by US global health assistance board on the actions and funding decisions that are within their control. So that means for the White House, we're scoring executive orders, presidential memoranda, whole of government strategies or reports that were issued or edited during that year, as well as legislation signed or vetoed by the president during that year. We also score the president's proposed budget amounts for family planning, maternal and child health, and HIV and AIDS. Agencies are a bit different. With agencies, we're looking at internal policies and procedures related to or in any way affecting global SRHR programming. Agencies' internal policies and procedures are included as an expression of an agency's direction, management, or guidelines related to the delivery of global health programming, as well as an expression of the agency's support for or opposition to global SRHR. So for each year of grades, we score actions that were either issued or edited during that calendar year. For example, with USAID, we would consider, oh, I think uh, our interpretation just crossed over. Everyone can hear me okay now? Okay. For example, with USAID, we would consider policies, procedures, strategies, technical guidance, vision statements, agency priority goals, and automated directive systems chapters. With regard to budget analysis for agencies, we calculate whether US global health funds are spent in countries with the highest need. As you can imagine, these budget calculations are complex and the timely release of publicly available budget data are vital for public to know where global health funding is being spent. Each action is scored based on the level to which it hindered or promoted SRHR. And we do that by asking if each action is evidence-informed, responsive to need, consistent with internationally recognized human rights norms, and gender transformative. So we call these our cross-cutting issues. By using these cross-cutting issues, we're able to look beyond merely the categories of family planning and maternal and child health and HIV and AIDS, and make sure that each action from the US government addresses all of it, SRHR, that issues like comprehensive sex education, gender-based violence, and abortion are addressed, 
that policies move beyond addressing general populations, but are tailored to reach all different populations, including LGBTQI individuals, sex workers, and adolescents. But to understand what all of this really means, you need to read the rationale statements. For each gr grade, we write a rationale that explains how each action either hindered or promoted SRHR. Now, I know you're seeing one, there's a lot of information. Please go in later and, and read all of these rationales. So to review, and I know this is a lot, all actors receive a grade for each domain in which they do relevant work. In addition, the US government receives an overall grade for each domain and a final composite grade for SRHR in US Global Health Assistance. As civil society, we have a duty to hold the US government accountable for the decision that, decisions it makes. And when it comes to decisions about global health spending and policies that impact the health and rights of people around the world, it is critical that civil society knows and understands funding levels and policies related to global health. Without this knowledge, we cannot effectively hold the US government accountable. Transparency and accountability are keys to good governance, and in fact, are vital to a functioning democracy. It is important that the information required to gauge and assess US government support for SRHR and global health is readily available, accessible, and informative. To assess this, the SRHR index includes a separate analogous transparency scale that evaluates each domain based on the availability of its source data. This transparency grade is then merged with the SRHR grade to generate a final grade that takes transparency into account by domain and or actor. This final grade therefore reflects not only the quality of government action or inaction vis-a-vis -vis SRHR, but also reflects the availability of data to which is available to make this assessment. Hence, a, a bad grade can be interpreted as being reflective of bad policies or insufficient budget allocations and or insufficient or inadequate data. A good grade, on the other hand, would only reflect the good policies, budget allocations, since the SRHR index does not reward the government for transparency and availability of information. Here you can see the 2021 White House grade, both with and, and without transparency. So the SRHR index is your one-stop shop for all actions related to global health assistance. We have a library page. It's a wildly exciting tool. It allows you to see all the actions that have been scored as part of the SRHR index grading process. This not only includes the actions from 2016 to 2021, but it also includes all of the actions that form the baseline going back as far as the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961. As administrations change, Congress, bureaus change, sometimes documents can get lost, but not here. You can always count on the SRHR index library to find all of the documents you need related to global health assistance. Listen, the SRHR index, it's a means to an end. It's not the end. The SRHR index is part of a process of ensuring that policies are responsive to the needs and people that the US government global health actions fully promote sexual and reproductive health and rights. Though the SRHR index methodology is comprehensive and evaluates an array of actions and funding information, it does have limitations. Specifically, the SRHR index only measures global health assistance, which is part of a broader category of funds known as foreign assistance. The SRHR index is not designed to grade rhetoric, such as social media posts or unofficial speeches by government actors. The SRHR index only evaluates official policies that are issued by the US government actors and global health funding that is allocated for SRHR. The SRHR index does not evaluate the efficacy or success of US global health programs to document the impact of US funding and policies on SRHR in countries as, around the world. As Giselle mentioned, Los Feminista issues reports and documents on, on the impact of these policies and budgets. Okay, so what you are about to be looking at now are 
the grades from 2016 through 2021. So in 2020 and 2021, you can see whether a grade went up, highlighted in green, went down, highlighted in red, or stayed the same, highlighted in yellow. Now, clearly, as you see, the White House's grades went up from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, but many other actors' grades stayed the same or even went down in some domains in 2021. Let's talk about why that is. We will link this chart in the chat now as I talk to you all about some of the trends that we have seen uh, over time. You can also find a link to this document on the SRHR Index website, and you can see how actors and domains have changed on the SRHR Index website using the feature year over year. So one thing you might immediately notice as you look at these grades is that HIV and AIDS is the highest graded domain across all years, administrations, and actors. The consistently high grades in this domain are largely due to high levels of funding budgeted and appropriated by the White House and Congress and high levels of responsiveness to need and disbursements of these funds by USAID and the State Department. In addition to high levels of funding, the HIV and AIDS domain grades remain higher due to provisions of critical SRHR guidance and documents released by PEPFAR, which include the annual country operational plan guidance, the COP guidance, um, which are largely based in evidence and human rights, responsive to need, and are gender accommodating. The SRHR index grades within the HIV and AIDS domains demonstrate that unlike other domains, HIV and AIDS actions and funding have largely been insulated from some of the more dramatic changes in funding and policies across administrations. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that our colleague Jan Janet Sala from the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator, Coordinator is here later to talk to you all more about some of these wins when we get into the panel portion of our event. So with regards to funding, the president's proposed budget amounts for global health in 2020 were lower than the uh, requested amounts for 2021. When exploring the budget trends from the White House over the past two years, you'll find that the family planning request was insufficient in 2020 and in 2021. However, the 2020 request was abysmally low, which greatly impacted the White House's grades in 2020 and clearly reflected the administration's stance on SRHR. President Biden's 2021 budget requests for HIV and AIDS and maternal and child health were high and greatly contributed to the increase in the White House's 2021 grades. While the funding requests for international family planning programs were significantly higher in 2021 when compared to 2020, we still expect the White House to request more funding for international family planning. I hope you can all take some time to look through the funding allocations from Congress and disbursements from the agencies. So SRHR, SRHR is everywhere and the SRHR index captures that you will see some actions that are graded that might seem less obvious uh, related to SRHR, but of, of course they are. Okay, for example, in 2021, USAID released Assessing Feasibility and Readiness for Cargo Drones in Health Supply Chains, a report that shared the findings of scoping visits in Malawi that explored the feasibility of using cargo drones to support global health supply chains with the long-term goal of avoiding stockouts, responding to emergency medical respect, uh, requests, and speeding up diagnostic sample delivery time to benefit global health beneficiaries. This was responsive to need in the time of COVID-19 pandemic, and the lessons presented in this action could support global health programs related to SRHR. Also, in 2021, the White House released an executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Now, we all know that climate change is an SRHR issue. And while this executive order was a critical step in addressing cl the climate crisis, SRHR was not meaningfully included as a cross-cutting issue in this action. Remember, actors are only graded on what is within their control. So for example, in 2020, 
the White House was scored on the President's Interagency Task Force report on U.S. government efforts to combat trafficking in persons. The report discussed the U.S. government's effort to end trafficking in the United States and globally. In our description of the report, we noted that the report did not integrate international human rights standards as a conflated commercial sex work and trafficking for the purposes of sex, which ultimately deny sex workers their rights and can impede efforts to prevent trafficking. However, the White House was presumably working under the issuance of the National Security Presidential Directive 22, known as NSPD 22, which was issued in 2002 by then President Bush, which expressed the official conflation of sex work and trafficking. And I quote from NSPD 22, the United States government opposes prostitution and any related activities. These activities are inherently harmful and dehumanizing. The United States government's position is that these activities should not be regulated as a legitimate form of work for any human being." End quote. To be clear, sex work is work. If the current White House removed NSPD 22 or issued new guidance that promoted the health and human rights of sex workers, this would greatly improve their grade. I would like to wrap up by talking about one of the major impacts we have seen from 2017 all the way through 2021. And that is the impact of the reinstatement and expansion, implementation, and revocation of protecting life and global health assistance, the global gag rule, uh, which Giselle so eloquently explained to all of us uh, in her opening remarks. In 2017, the presidential memorandum that reinstated and expanded the policy to all global health assistance caused dramatic drops in the White House's grades across all domains. By reinstating and expanding the policy to apply to all US global health assistance funds, the White House substantially hindered sexual and reproductive health and rights by ignoring human rights principles and available evidence documenting the harmful impact of past iterations of the policy on the health and well being of people around the world. In 2021, the Biden administration's presidential memorandum on protecting women's health at home and abroad immediately revoked the GGR and states that it is the administration's priority to, and I quote, support women and girls sexual and reproductive health and rights in the United States, as well as globally, end quote. This action marked the first time at the that a US administration has actively supported SRHR at the presidential level. This action was responsive to need, consistent with human rights norms and based in evidence. And this action significantly promoted SRHR. But it's not just about the reinstatement and the revocation of the GGR that matters. The implementation of these policies matter. And that falls on the agencies. Multiple actors were tasked with implementing the GGR, which contributed to their lower grades across domains when the policy was in place. Now, because these actors were required to implement the policy, they were not graded on the policy's existence, but rather on the issues that were within their control, such as the release of frequently asked questions and other guidance related to the implementation of the policy. So for example, in 2018, the Department of State released the inconclusive PLGHA six-month review, which ignored some of the available data and evidence on the impact of the policy on U.S. global health assistance programs across all three domains. And this contributed to a drop in the Department of State's grade in, in two domains. In 2019, USAID included guidance about GGR in the Automated Directive Systems Chapters 303 and 308 and the related standard provisions. These policy documents were neither gender transformative nor based in evidence or human rights, which contributed to USAID's C grades in family planning and maternal and child health in 2019. Now, come to the present, or in 2021, in 2021, these three ADS chapters, all three ADS chapter 303 materials were updated and the GGR section was removed 
with the words reserved in its place. No ADS materials were updated to indicate that the policy had been revoked and no information was given to provide NGOs with guidance on how to implement the revocation and adapt their programs accordingly. We can see here, it, it takes time for the changes at the highest level of the administration to trickle down to meaningful changes across agencies. Our vision from Fos Feminista is that the SRHR index will lead to stronger policies and programs across the US government that will advance universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Transparency, accountability, and using data for advocacy and this engagement between governments and civil society is critical. I am so glad we have such an esteemed panel of experts to discuss their work in this area. And in order to get that started, I would like to introduce you all to my dear friend and colleague, Jess Jacobs, who will moderate this discussion. Jess is an award-winning actress, a writer, producer, and abortion justice advocate. She has premiered films at Cannes, South by Southwest, Seattle International Film Festival, and others, as well as on Hulu and Topic. Jess was the co-founder of the women-led New York-based production production company, Invisible Pictures, and is currently touring her most recent film, Choices. I've seen it, it was great. In parallel to her creative work, Jess is known for her global advocacy and philanthropy in reproductive health, rights, and abortion justice, notably by partnering with NGOs on the creation of a short film on the global gag rule entitled The Global Her Project, distributed by Teen Vogue. She was named one of Real Leaders Magazine's 100 Visionary Leaders and is the chair of the board of Rooftop Films. Jess, we're so happy you're here. Let me hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Bergen. I think I'm gonna have you do all of my introductions from now on. Um, I'm, I'm just so unbelievably um, honored to be here. As she shared, I'm, I'm Jess Jacobs. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I will be moderating, moderating this conversation between three incredible leaders in the work of sexual and reproductive health and rights. So anybody who has done global SRHR work knows that all of our freedoms are intertwined in the global north and the global south. And as an American, I know that so many people in the United States are feeling that more than ever. So it is as meaningful as ever to be able to be a part of this conversation, and especially as it pertains to government accountability. So I'm going to ask each of our esteemed panelists a question. I will then ask all three of them a question together, and then we will move into a Q&A uh, portion from all of you. So throughout our conversation, please, I encourage you to use the Q&A box. Um, you can ask questions there to any or all of our panelists. Um, and I see a number of you have already done this, but you can also use the chat box to introduce yourselves to each other. So I'm going to start with Charmaine Picardo. Charmaine is the SAF AIDS Regional Senior Programmer, Program Officer for SRHR and Gender. She is an ex experienced SRHR, Gender and Health Department e expert with a demonstrated history of working in civil society in the SADC region, leading and supporting programming in gender justice and quality, policy advocacy, sexual and reproductive health and rights, safe abortion policy advocacy, HIV and youth leadership training and development. Charmaine is a 2014 Washington Fellow for Young African Leaders Initiative Fellow and a 2015 Canon Collins Scholar. She holds a specialized master's degree in gender studies from the University of Sussex. Charmaine, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's such an honor. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about SAFAID's work around social accountability. So can you tell us all a little bit more about how you engage member states, ministries of health, and can you tell me a bit about the success of the tool? Uh, thank you very much, Jess, and thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I think I'll say good afternoon because of the different time zones. It's currently afternoon where I am, uh, but thank you very much for the kind introduction, and I'm so excited to be part of this launch. Congratulations to was the minister for, for the launch. Um, so the SAF AIDS, I'm going to talk uh, about the SAF AIDS um, social accountability 
model on the work that we've currently been doing in Southern Africa or in member states that make up the Southern African development uh, community. So if I'm going too fast, yes, please feel free to stop me and ask me to slow down and I will um, I will do so. So the SAFAID's uh, social accountability monitoring uh, for sexual reproductive health and rights model is a seven pronged interlinked evidence-based advocacy model. And it is aimed at improving sexual and reproductive health service provision within the public resource management um, system. So we are currently working and applying this model in six countries within Southern Africa, and that is Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Zambia. And all of those um, six countries have either been recipients or are currently recipients of um, US government funding, you know, mainly through USAID and, and PEPFAR. Um, so what we do with the model is, first of all, engage with, with the member states before application of, of the model to understand, to police the government or to police the ministries of health, but it's actually a resource that the ministries of health can use to track and see where the gaps are in terms of resource allocation. And this includes finances as well as personnel um, allocation in terms of delivery of youth friendly sexual and reproductive health and rights, and also looking at how they can take up some of the issues. So, the very young people. So, you see in a minute why I'm, I'm talking about um, the recommendations. But the first step with the accountability work is capacity building focused on adolescents and young people. And this is using um, a toolkit that was developed by South Aids focusing on um, social accountability monitoring, especially for sexual and reproductive health and rights. And it's focused on generating and creating an empowered pool of what we call SAM champions or social accountability youth champions. And at inception, it's focused as well on sensitization and capacity building of public health service providers. Um, these are employed by the ministries of health as well as min senior minister of health official to understand the model and to understand what it means to start applying or using the application in their respective clinics and respective uh, facilities um, in the different um, sites and it, the second prong is evidence generation through an application there's a mobile application that was then developed to go side by side with this model and it equips adolescents and young people to be able to use this tool to collect data. So when young people go to the facilities that would have selected in the countries, when they go to the facilities, fail to access services or their barriers, their challenges that they're facing, what they'll do is they'll raise a ticket and this ticket pops up in real time and it can be seen by the administrators at the health facility. It can also be seen by the health service uh, providers. And if it's an issue that is can easily be resolved, then they call back the young person to whether access the service or you know make a referral for the young person to be able to go to a different facility. But if it's not an issue that can easily be resolved, the ticket remains open. The ticket can only be closed by the young person that opened the that opened the ticket. So all outstanding tickets at a certain end of at the end of a certain period all become advocacy issues that are then taken up to the next level, whether that's the provincial level, the national level, to then engage with the Ministry of Health as, and then to, at a lesser level, engage with the health facility to see whether it's a budget issue, it's a commodity stockout issue. And there are, there are three key service categories, which is HIV testing and treatment services, as well as family planning and safe abortion services, and lastly, sexual gender-based violence response services. So the tickets that then remain open become then the advocacy issues that the young people take forward to engage with policymakers, to engage with the government, to see then how this evidence can be used to direct the decisions and um, that government um, is making. And the third prong is um, the data analysis now, and this is validated through community scorecard processes, community dialogues and interface meetings. And at a higher level, this also feeds into national and regional platforms where policymakers and governments convene. And then the fourth prong is policy advocacy strategies. This is post analysis of the data, and it's also focused 
or focuses on coming up with advocacy plans of action at national level and as well as regional level through a regional body of young people that we call um, accountability. They're part of a, an accountability alliance and they come from different countries within the region. And um, also looking at partnerships, so en enhancing partnerships with government and enhancing partnerships with health service providers. And through the partnerships, then government gets to understand or the ministries of health get to understand then that civil society is not there trying to out them, for lack of a better word, but we're actually there to ensure that we catalyze and accelerate uh, some of the commitments that they would have made and actually translate them into, into action. So the, um, the, the model uh, provides young people with knowledge, with skills and confidence to exert agency and be able to lead their own sexual and reproductive health and rights agenda within the commitments and the frameworks and the priorities that would have been set by member states or the governments. And it also builds empowered young social assets who recognize their right to bear a role and how to effectively engage with duty bearers uh, through use of evidence to remove barriers to quality and non-discriminatory sexual and reproductive health services. It also creates a healthy and evidence-based advocacy space between young people, youth serving civil society organizations, health service providers, and policymakers. So the policymakers and other government representatives. And it also fosters and sustains buy-in from governments, uh, particularly the ministries of health, and health service provider right from inception. It also increases demand for sexual and reproductive health services by adolescents and young people and contributes to a decrease in risk and vulnerability amongst adolescents and young people to poor sexual and reproductive health outcomes, creating a movement. So it has created a regional movement. So firstly, national movements that then feeds into the region where young people are able to caucus and share experiences and best practices from their countries, as well as engage with the governments at different levels that are being convened um, across the region. It also provides young people with an M Health or digital evidence generation mechanism. So this is through the Mobi Safades application, which is easy to use and safe because all the tickets that are raised are anonymous or there's confidentiality or confidentiality of the young people is protected throughout. And moving on to the successes uh, from the implementation of the accountability work. So we've seen an increase in the sites in, in the six pilot countries that I mentioned. So at inception, we had only six sites and over the past two years, these have increased to 28 sites across the six um, countries. And these sites are in urban, peri-urban and rural areas. And to date, we have about 25, uh, almost 26,000 registered users of the Mobisoft AIDS application. And the over 3,500 tickets that have been raised to date, 50% um, of the issues were resolved. And those issues that have remained unresolved have become then the advocacy issues that young people have been able to take up right from the local level to the national level, engaging with the ministries of health, engaging with policymakers, including parliamentarians, to raise the issues or flag out where the gaps are and where government needs to direct, whether it's the domestic resource budgeting and financing or looking at the funds that are coming into the country, where to direct them if it's, uh, for example, restocking um, contraceptive commodities, ensuring that the uh, adequately trained personnel were able to administer and deliver health, service, um, health services for adolescents and young people. It has also created evidence-based advocacy, which is led by young people with increased engagement with policymakers and government and increased voices of young people in the policy advocacy spaces, right from the local level all the way up to the regional level. and. Um, it has also led to the launch of the regional sexual and reproductive health and rights youth advocacy and accountability alliance which has 18 members that are coming from eight SADA countries and it is these alliance members then that are also taking up initiative and are escalating advocacy from national to regional levels calling governments to account targeting um policymakers. We've also seen a move from rhetorical commitments to measurable actions as a result of policy engagements. For example, we've seen increased allocation of additional youth-friendly services for adolescent um, sexual and reproductive health services in Zimbabwe, Eswatini, Lesotho, and Zambia. We've also seen reduced sexual and reproductive health commodity stock out in Malawi, 
and in South Africa, based on reported barriers to access commodities through the Movistar Pays application by adolescents and young people. We've also um, seen continued buy-in by the respective governments of, of the six countries to scale up the Mobi Staff AIDS application and ensure sustainability of the model and sustainability of the application. So in Zimbabwe, the Ministry of Health and Child Care and, and Staff AIDS have commenced discussions around adopting the application for monitoring sexual reproductive health service barriers in additional health facilities in the country. And in Zambia, we've seen um, app-generated evidence is being routinely reported and Ministry of Health planning meetings and cons consultations on scale up to additional facilities is also being advanced. And in Eswatini, the Ministry of Health has incorporated the same for SRHR model and application in their work plan. And they're also collaborating with other partners to scale up to new sites. And the application is being adapted for different other programs that are being um, implemented in the country or that are just starting out um, in the country. In Lesotho, the Ministry of Health is in discussions with UNFPA and South AIDS on the scale up of the application into new sites. Whilst in South Africa, the application was also adapted for a new program that is being implemented by a different um, stakeholder and is focused on advocacy and community-based monitoring of HIV and TB services for key populations. And so the value addition of, of the same form sexual and reproductive health and rights model so the same for SRHR model is an accountability tool. And just like the SRHR index, it consolidates and contributes to evidence to amplify advocacy towards advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights in line with the sustainable development goals with commitments made under universal health coverage and other key global, regional and national frameworks, strategies and priorities. It also catalyzes actioning of state commitments and puts the spotlight on existing gaps in areas of funding, of domestic budgeting, resource allocation and spending, implementation of laws and policies, as well as ensuring that the, um, there's adequate personnel that are delivering quality services. And it's also looking at the access and acceptability of services and commodities. So I think for now, I'll end here. Thank you very much, Jess. Thank you so much, Charmaine, and congratulations on such incredible success. Um, the use of, of technology, the activation of young people, um, you know, ensuring their agency, it's such a powerful piece of all of this. So thank you for sharing all of the incredible work that you've done. Um, I am so honored to get to uh, move to Dr. Janet Saul, who I'll be introducing. Uh, Dr. Janet Saul is the Director of Gender Programming for PEPFAR in the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and Health Diplomacy at the U.S. Department of State. In this position, Janet provides technical leadership for the DREAMS Partnership. She also advises senior leadership on strategic directions for programmatic and research activities related to primary prevention of sexual violence and HIV among young adolescents, gender equality, violence prevention and response, SRH services, as well as how these issues impact the successful delivery of HIV prevention, care, and treatment. Prior to her current role, Janet provided leadership for over 25 years on the evaluation of HIV and the violence prevention strategies, as well as linking science and practice at CDC. She is a behavioral scientist with a PhD in community psychology. Janet, hi. So the SRHR index scores actors on their ability to reach beyond the general population to meet the needs of key communities. That includes adolescent girls and young women, sex workers, people living with disabilities, etc. PEPFAR has consistently contributed to the success of the domain grade in HIV. So can you tell us more about PEPFAR's specific work that contributes to this grade uh, and especially including PEPFAR's commitment to engaging with civil society? Sure. Thank you so much for having me having me here today. And um, I I'm really thrilled to be part of this launch of the of the SRHR index. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is such an important issue for PEPFAR programming and for the people that we serve. The index we're talking about today is based on past work that we've all done, but we're really fortunate to have the support to double down on these critical priorities. 
As you know, advancing SRHR is core to the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to achieving gender equality and, and promoting and protecting human rights of women, girls, LGBTQI plus persons, particularly those who are facing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. And at PEPFAR, our current leader, Ambassador um, Dr. John Kengasong has laid out his vision and approach for PEPFAR recently, including health equity for priority populations as a strategic pillar. So we're doing all of this work in this context. Um, so to answer your question about our ability to reach beyond the general population, I'll start with the data. Because at PEPFAR, we always start with the data, right? When we look at HIV data, we identify three main priority populations. These include adolescent girls and young women, children, and key populations. For us, key populations, when I talk about key populations, I'm talking about men who have sex with men, transgender women, female sex workers, and people who inject drugs. Um, both key populations and adolescent girls and young women face greater risks of HIV acquisi acquisition than the general population. And, and part of that is due to marginalization, stigma, discrimination, and in some cases, even criminalization. Um, children who are living with HIV are less likely to be identified as living with HIV, and so therefore are often delayed at receiving life-saving treatments, more delayed than adults. So we really work to, um, and, and PEPFAR has committed to close these treatment and prevention gaps for the priority populations. In order to do that, we have to use health equity or gender transformative approaches um, in order that we're making sure we're addressing the unique needs of each population rather than a very generalized approach. So, so what does that look like? Like that's a lot of words, right? A lot of jargony words. Um, and so what does that really look like? Like if we talk about um, a health equity approach for key populations, um, so in COP22, those act, so those activities will start October, October 1st. So just in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, for key populations, we have an increased focus on improving um, and enabling environment for HIV service delivery to key populations. This includes things like strengthening the KP competency of our service providers, supporting the leadership and capacity of KP-led civil society organizations, um, better data to guide our activities, and transformative interventions to address structural barriers. DREAMS, um, which is a, a public-private partnership um, of comprehensive HIV prevention for adolescent girls and young women um, that PEPFAR launched in 2014, DREAMS uses a gender equity approach to HIV prevention. To, this addresses the disproportional risk that adolescent girls and young women face. Um, DREAMS programming delivers biomedical, behavioral, and structural interventions. The SRHR component of DREAMS is multifaceted. It includes things like voluntary family planning with a focus on dual protection, HIV testing, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, and post-violence care. We also do SRHR education um, as part of our HIV education in both schools and community settings. And there are also gender transformative components. So we have, um, we have community mobilization and norms change activities to address harmful gender norms at the community level. But even though PEPFAR is an HIV program, um, you know, Bergen mentioned the domains that this index looks at. Um, we don't only focus on SR uh, on HIV. Um, we also, you know, I just talked about the family planning services in DREAMS, but we also have maternal and child health services that address cervical cancer and mother to child transmission. Uh, women and women who are um, living with HIV have a six-fold increased risk of cervical cancer. So we have a partnership called the Go Further Public-Private Partnership, where we've committed to reducing new cervical cancer cases by 95% among women living with HIV in 12 African countries. And these countries have some of the highest rates of HIV and cervical cancer in the world. 
PEPFAR also supports an effective, um, an effective cascade of programming to prevent mother to child transmission. Antenatal services, HIV testing, ART for life, safe childbirth and breastfeeding practices, and infant HIV testing. And the goal of all of these activities, the, the goals are twofold. Um, babies born without HIV and healthy mothers with suppressed viral loads. But we can't do all of this on our own, right? So a big part of what we do is engage the stakeholders who are so important to the HIV response. Ambassador and Kenga Song has identified community leadership as a critical enabler of the work we do. So this goes beyond engagement so to sustain sustained leadership in all of the elements of our work. So from priority setting to funding allocations to program design and results management, we've continued to support something called community-led monitoring. And what this is, is our, our participants in our programs um, work through local independent civil society organizations to formally and routinely monitor the quality and accessibility of our HIV services, as well as the patient provider experience. So this has become a critical data point for us to really complement some of our other data streams that we have to make sure that the perspective of those who we serve and the leadership of the communities that we work in guide and inform our services and promote transparency. Finally, a critical form of engagement is to listen to the voices of our program participants. DREAMS is an example of that. Since the beginning, DREAMS has had an intentional practice of regularly listening to our, participants, our, our participants to not only assess what is going well and what is helpful, but more importantly, to tell us what can be improved and what is missing. Inputs input from DREAMS participants has changed the DREAMS programming over the years. It is, it is, um, it had us enhance our economic strengthening interventions, as well as deliver more SRHR services in the community during our safe space meetings. So, so Jess, I would sum up PEPFAR's approach to SRHR by saying we look at the data, we provide comprehensive services that include all three of the domains. And finally, we listen to the populations we are serving and promote their leadership in the HIV response to be sure that our approaches are indeed meeting their unique needs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. And I, I just have to say that as a member of civil society in the States to hear uh, a government actor speaking with words like gender equity and uh, transformation is, is really encouraging. Um, so thank you so much for, for all of the information. And last but absolutely not least, uh, we have Ana Lavandera Monteblanco. She is a midwife and the executive director of Iniciativas Sanitarias, a civil society organization based in Uruguay and is a national, regional, and global leader in the optimization of healthcare, clinical research, and advocacy related to sexual and reproductive health and gender equity, including safe abortion, universal dissemination of contraceptives, and the prevention of sexual and gender-based violence. Iniciativas Sanitarias is one of the leading organizations involved in the Center for Evidence-Based Advocacy, along with Catholics for the Right to Decide in Mexico and Argentina. Ana Lavandera has been a leader in the SRHR movement for more than 40 years. Ana, thank you so much for being here. My question for you, Iniciativa Sanitarias has a long history of using accountability tools like the index to promote SRHR. Can you please speak to how these tools advance your organization's work? Thank you, Jess, for the introduction, and I'd like to thank FOSS for the invitation to be part of this panel. As an introduction, I'd like to say that Iniciativas Sanitarias is the only multi 
interdisciplinary movement of health professionals in Uruguay together with uh, health workers, attorneys, youth, representatives of society, and people committed to equal access to sexual and reproductive health. We've been for working for 10 decades using evidence-based information to improve the access to health rights in Uruguay. In strict in close uh, with academic institutions, we push evidence-based uh, policies that guarantee equal opportunities that allow for changing the patriarchal views in health and to ensure the uh, provision of conscience as a way of protecting the weakest. In terms of your question about Uruguay and Latin America, I would like to celebrate the Sexual Reproductive Health Index. I think this new tool has potential in three areas as a, a way of evaluating reality and uh, in civil and organized society, as a also as a tool for decision makers in health policies and as a tool for international organizations and donors. And because the information generated, the indicators, uh, is a powerful uh, tool for change using in democracy, not just words. And the role of social accountability is a key role in decision making, evaluation, and uh, in bringing about accountability, because it not only means encouraging transparency and greater access to information, but a deeper change that changes the relationship between the govern government and civil society, between the governors and the citizens. It's very important to streamline the in information available, to make legitimate and position our transformative narratives available so that governments can establish uh, priorities, make informed decisions, and establish policies that are evidence-based. If we talk about uh, advocacy based on uh, evidence. We at Iniciativas uh, Sanitarias uh, use these indicators as part of our movement. In 2001, about 20 years ago, the indicators the, put us in a very bad ranking. Uruguay was the country that had the highest maternal deaths for because of abortion, risky abortion. So abortion was at that time a crime. And the health teams at the in the forefront debated about our impotence in being able to provide help to the users. However, with a plan of action and an interinstitutional evidence-based dialogue, we changed the focus on the problem. We thought about a different discourse with different dis detractors. And on an evidence-based model, we uh, provided greater care. We put an end to polarization in favor of or against abortion. And instead, we created a new narrative with the civil society movement. We took abortion away from the police reports, from the media, and instead we talked about the right to health. It seemed like it was impossible, but it wasn't. This initiative taken by Zitativas and Sanitaris is what gave the name to our organization. We wanted to be part of the solution, not the problem. We used evidence and a professional conscience commitment, which as a multi-professional group, we demanded from day to day. To work on the basis of evidence has allowed us to understand, to have arguments, and to move forward in advancing sexual and reproductive rights in Uruguay. For instance, we were able to intervene and drastically drop the number of abortion, unsafe abortion deaths that took place in our country. They dropped to zero and have remained there over the last few years. We were able to provide arguments to the law on sexual and reproductive rights, which in Uruguay guarantees the conditions for sexual and reproductive rights of the entire population, because this is universal right. And as well as the right to the voluntary interruption of a pregnancy going back to 2012. We have collaborated and continue to do this from the perspective of gender and human rights, which is very important to 
implement this in the field. We have created uh, monitors for uh, monitoring quality in, in the institutions, in the users, so that they can be able to take advantage of their rights and, ex and demand their rights. We have created, for instance, the clinical manual on sexual violence and couple violence, which we have prepared jointly with the Pan American Health Organization. All of this with the unconditional support and coordinated ongoing work with Post, post feminista over the years. At the national level, we have also used these tools. For instance, the law on access to information forces organizations to provide the information and allowed us analyze data in an intersectional manner. And we have been able to see that most of our countries in the region have a reality that leads to inequality and keeps women prisoners. The open uh, government program, which is another one we have. It was initiated by the last government in 2021. They took it up. We have created dialogue basis with civil society and led to a plan of action that uh, brought about several initiatives from civil society. Another work we do is work with the Congress, trying to uh, make sure that before a draft bill is presented, they are informed. And at the ministerial level in the Ministry of Public Health, we are part of the Advisory Committee on Sexual and Reproductive Rights together with other civil society organizations and academics in order to be able to ensure permanent accountability on the part of the government in this area, making sure that it's based on rights from a gender perspective. We, because we must ensure there's political will because without political will, there's no law and there's nothing that can bring about a change in exercising sexual and reproductive rights through evidence-based information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for all of that information and, and for sharing all of the great work that you're doing. Um, before we move on to the audience Q&A, and a reminder to be placing uh, questions in the Q&A box if you have any for our esteemed panelists, I would like to end with something hopeful. So for every panelist, I'm asking, where do you see the most opportunity to promote SRHR in the coming future? I'll start with Charmaine. Um, thank you very much, Chis. I think um, maybe I'll speak as someone that's working with young people as well, directly with young people, but I, I, I believe that there's greater opportunity with working with young people um, in all their diversity. So all the subgroups, adolescent girls and young women, um, young people within the LGBTI uh, Q sector, young people with disability, you know, young people in the entire spectrum. I think there's a lot of opportunities with the young people, but what we just need to ensure is that at a global level, trickling down to the local level, that we are making the right investments. You know, the same investments that go through the bigger sectors, whether it's mining, it's um, other sectors that everyone keeps pumping resources towards, it's the same, even greater, that should go towards and We might have lost Charmaine there. All right, I'll 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 come back to her if she pops back on. Janet, I'll pass to you next. Where do you see the most opportunity to promote SRHR in the country? Ensuring that. I think a couple of things. I mean, secure the futures oh, of adolescents. Thank you. I think a couple of things um, that we could do. One is to apply the lessons that we learned during, you know, during the pandemic that we're all still living through, right, during COVID. So we, um, during COVID, we tried some things that I think were really um, well received by the populations that we serve. And I think we can expand those. So we expanded our delivery models to make sure that um, during the pandemic, people have had access to the full spectrum of SRHR services. Things like, you know, dispensing, things like, prep, 
you know, multi giving people multi month supplies and taking more services to the community. This was well received by the communities and by the participants, and I think we can expand that. And then, secondly, I think what we can do is I talked about really listening to the voices of the people that that we're serving. Um, and one of the things that we hear over and over again, um, and I know you want to end on a positive note, so I am going to make this positive. But one of the things that we hear over and over again is that many of our program participants are still not comfortable accessing the services that are provided because of stigma, judgment, discrimination. And so one of the things that I think we all, you know, that we, that PEPFAR is committed to um, is working on norms change. Um, and so expanding, what PEPFAR is already doing some work on norms change through dreams, but expanding that beyond dreams because, because supporting norms that, you know, that support rather than stigmatize populations like key populations and adolescent girls and young women. I think that will go a long way to getting us towards our goal of everyone having access. And then finally, I think we can do some things at the individual facility and provider role. There are evidence-based provider trainings out there um, with monitoring and supervision to create non-judgmental, non-stigmatizing services. So we can be sure that when an adolescent girl or young woman or a member of a key population gathers the courage to walk in and ask for services, they are not shamed, they are not judged. So our goal is that they're greeted with respect and dignity so they will return and be able to access whatever services they need to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I absolutely love that answer. Anna, I will ask you the same question. Where do you see the opportunity to promote SRHI mm -hmm. in the coming future? Well, I think that we have a great opportunity here in Latin America in terms of data and evidence and generation in order to produce new transformative narratives in the present and the future of Latin America within the framework launched by Post Feminista and in the uh, evidence center, uh, evidence based center, and formed, as Giselle explained, by by the experiences in Argentina, Mexico initiative, we we work by strengthening regional strategies and advocacy from a feminist lens that would weigh the collective processes in a cross-cutting and intersectional manner. Some lines of work that we've included, just as an example, well, the monitoring and, and commitment tools of the Montevideo Consensus, one of the most advanced uh, documents in recent years in terms of sexual reproductive rights, uh, the social report of these commitments known as Mira Que Te Miro, launched by over 25 civil society organizations and eight regional networks. It, it is indispensable when we will attempt to strengthen accountability, strengthen the efficiency of civil ac society actions. We also have the universal, uh, regular, or periodical examinations to position those items that are still outstanding in the regional, national, and domestic agendas in order to celebrate the progress that has been achieved and imprint visibility of the achievements in each of the country. We also systematize best practices and lessons learned in advocacy, as well as the results of existing research and other processes aimed at developing policy, public policy in terms of sexual and reproductive health uh, from the lens of, of uh, health evidence and uh, laity and human rights. The progress that has been experienced both nationally and regionally, in addition to the crisis brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of global of climate change uh, produces environments increasingly more difficult, thus adding uh, challenges to our participation, either because spaces are being restricted for citizens' participation or because there is an intentional opacity in the way public policies management, in, in, in the way they're managed or direct attacks. This means that in a restricted participatory context or with governments that are not favorable to our agendas, is there no space to advocate? In our experience, that's not the, uh, the case. Indeed, the existence of political will and stable professional systems are fundamental factors for processes, for advocacy processes, and perhaps in Uruguay, this 
this uh, victories in this area would have been delayed further. However, the political scenario has changed significantly. And today we see a backlash in the thrust that uh, the uh, agenda in this uh, in this field had experienced in recent years. We now work in well articulated between civil society, academia, and the government promoted by the government itself. Given this situation, the strategy has been to join efforts with other networks and organizations seeking which are the roads for less resistance. This has been the way that we've been working constantly in recent years so as to achieve changes in any way possible. In sum, in order to strengthen our democracy, it is essential to play an active role, that citizens play an active role. And this is a process that contributes to the construction of our movement, listening closely to different voices that has been said here from a social practice and deconstructing patriarchal concepts. In the work of Iniciativas Sanitarias by informing our population, we work towards the construction of an active citizenship in a public space that will materialize in the participation, advocating, of our rights that have been conquered and the construction of new rights in the political arena by promoting accountability, uh, transparency processes, and also bringing about proposals and fostering laws and public policy that will benefit all of the community, that it, they will truly be universal. It is in this way, in addition to others, that as our institutional slogan reads, we must be part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm hearing that our future lies in the hands of the youth. I'm hearing that we our focus on narrative change and destigmatization will be a big part of getting ourselves to a, a gender equity and a sexual and reproductive health equitable world um, and, and continuing to build on these incredible movements and encouraging continued political will from civil society uh, is, is where the light at the end of the tunnel is shining. So I'm going to be able to move now into some audience questions. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of them, which is so exciting. Okay, so Janet, I'm gonna start with you. I've got two questions for you here and I'm gonna ask them both together in hopes that you can briefly um, um, answer both of them. So the first question is, are there going to be more fun opportunities soon for SRHR activities in low and middle income countries? A big struggle for improving SRHR, especially within adolescent and youth-friendly services, is ensuring staff and programs are funded to provide these vital services. So that's the first question. The second is, where do you see an opportunity for the findings of the SRHR index to be incorporated into PEPFAR's work? And thank you for your contributions to today's panel. Sure, thank you. So the funding question, I'm not sure what, um, Natasia, what um, country you're from, um, PEPFAR has very specific countries that we that we're mandated to work in. Um, there is within PEPFAR over the last several years um, a requirement that we fund more local organizations, that we fund more women-led, um, key populations-led organizations. So I think there is more opportunity. Um, it is a country-led process. And that process, civil society is, um, it's, it is a requirement that civil society is engaged in that. So I would be happy to have a follow-up conversation, you know, and, and, you know, figure out what country you're in and, and whether it's a pet bar country. And if it is, explain to you how all of that works. Um, and then on the question of um, the findings, we're still digesting them. But one of the things that I did notice um, when it came to um, the things that PEPFAR does is a lot of um, a, a lot of comments that you know things were marginally or not really gender transformative, and I think that's something that we really could work on. I do think we do some gender transformative work, but um, we we can improve that and need to improve that. So I think that that's a big takeaway from me um, for the work that we're doing in PEPFAR from the index. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question that has come in for all of the panelists. The question is, what evidence or issues do you want countries to champion this week at the UN General Assembly? Anna, I'll start with you. Okay, yeah. gracias. Sí, a mí me parece muy importante el hecho I think 
it's very important that after many years of fighting and we'll continue to fight the region to improve, we know that the region of the Americas is the most unequal in the, in the world, the greatest inequality. And I don't know if that's a topic that needs to be discussed at the UN, but what we do is we reject the fact that the financing for our programs, our policies, our projects are in the hands of the index in each country, because behind these data, there's a lot of inequality. There are a lot of problems within countries and in the most remote areas. So we should no longer see it from the, that perspective, but instead from the perspective of the evidence achieved through other standards, other indicators that address the deep inequality that exists in this region. Thank you. Charmaine, I'll pop the question to you next. Uh, thank you very much, Jess. Um, I think the countries really need to have start having honest conversations around intersects between sexual reproductive health and rights and such issues as climate action responses, and also look at gender equality and other very topical issues right now. Because I think from learnings from, from the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen that it's very easy for sexual and reproductive health and rights issues to be relegated to the margins. And now as the world is moving forward and talking about the other issues such as climate action, uh, humanitarian responses, we see that again, sexual and reproductive health and rights does not always make it to the agenda or make it to the table. So there's need to bring out those intersectionalities. There is no way we can talk about achieving sustainable development in 2030 without looking at the interlinkages and ensuring that we are putting forward all the resources that we need to, and we're putting forward the investments. And we really need to move away from the rhetorical declarations, move away from just signing things and ensure that we are moving towards action. I think we've had decades of signing onto declarations of member states, of, of countries, presidents, head of states, going to summits and global platforms and signing onto things, but we don't see it now when they go back to their respective nations. I think we need to see more of that. We need to see that commitment being accelerated and catalyzed into actual action to ensure that we are really and truly speaking about issues of equality and equity and that we are truly moving towards sustainable development. Thank you. That's it's so brilliant to, to, to talk about signings, not translating into action during a conversation about government accountability, because that's really ultimately the, the sort of issue that you're raising. Um, where is the accountability when this paper is signed? So thank you, Charmaine, for, for bringing that up. I think that that's just absolutely spot on. Janet, same question. I mean, I, I'm not sure I can really add to that. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the, you know, ha having deep conversations about, you know, what the barriers are. And so many of these barriers are deeply rooted in inequality. And, and I think that, um, that, you know, that that gathering is such an opportunity to have those deep conversations and, and what needs to change to address those inequalities. Because, I mean, from the HIV response perspective, we can only get so far with medication and even evidence-based prevention programs. But if the, if the, if the basic any, if the basic equality of people is still um, it, it is still at risk, then you know we are limited in what we can do about things like HIV. Over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for for those thoughtful and and thorough answers. I've got. It looks like one final question, um, I believe for Bergen. Um, so Bergen, I'll bring you back on stage. Um, this is a, these are, there are questions from uh, Miriam Narcisse and Consuela Bowen that have some overlap here. So I'm gonna try and combine the two. Um, so Miriam notes excitement about this tool. 
Uh, and she's wondering about the potential for advocacy with USAID at the national level by the young female community leaders from HAGM. The potential for cross-sectoral intervention is enormous, especially with regards to Haiti's government's commitments to 2019 ICPD. So what is the plan for disseminating this resource, meaning translation, training on how to use it, translation into advocacy practice, et cetera. Uh, Consuelo asks similarly, if this tool could be adapted to more local context in Latin America, where is where there is ethnic diversity? Fantastic questions, and, and thank you both so much. So in terms of, of the tool, yes, absolutely use it at the local level with uh, advocacy towards USAID. Um, for, for translation, uh, the a document that we shared earlier that explains what the index is, the methodology, and what the grades have been from 2016 through 2021, uh, that document is available in English, in Spanish, in Portuguese, and in French. Uh, and in terms of trainings for how to use the index, now right now, unfortunately, this one is only available in English, but if you go to the SRHR index website, you can see tutorials about how the methodology works, what this transparency is, um, and, and gives an overview of the index, much like what I talked about today. Uh, so that is all fully available. We absolutely want to make the full resource available in multiple, multiple language give us a little bit of time, we are working on it. And in terms of trainings, yes, we are always available. I am always available. Sammy's always available to give trainings on the SRHR index. We do schedule from time to time webinars like this, but you don't have to wait for a webinar. My email is on the index website. It is on the flyer. Email me, we will set up a time. Um, in terms of replicating the methodology, yes. Yes, you can do this. And for that, I have to thank the incredible team from the Global Women's Institute at the George Washington University who really worked with us to ensure that this methodology is replicable. Here's what the methodology does. It is a methodology that allows you to compare what is being done to what could or should be being done. So this could be a methodology that works about sexual and reproductive health and rights and U.S. global health assistance? Sure. But you could also use it for something that doesn't even have to do with sexual and reproductive health and rights. You could use the methodology as a tool to hold a government or an actor in power accountable to their commitments on climate change. You could adapt it to work with different governments. It's, it's a really exciting methodology. We have no desire to keep it to ourselves. We want to share it. We want to replicate it. Uh, we want you to use it and make it your own. So please contact me to dire directly. And uh, I look forward to, to chatting with you both and anyone else who uh, would like to adapt the index to their own context. And I'll stop right there. I think that that is evidence of Fos Feminista's commitment to feminist practice, saying we're, we've created this incredible tool and all we wanna do is, is share it, disseminate it, make it available. So thank you, Bergen, for those answers. Thank you so much to our esteemed panelists, Ana Lavandera, Dr. Janet Saul, and Charmaine Picardo for joining us today. This was beyond powerful. Uh, Giselle, it's so nice to, to see your face again. And, and, and uh, thank you for all of the incredible work that you do at Fos Feminista. Bergen, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this um, and for the incredible index. Um, there will be a number of, I think, um, links that will be dropped in the chat. Uh, you can see that there is so much work that we can do collectively to ensure that US Global Health Assistance promotes SRHR around the world. Um, and so we're so grateful to all of you for participating in this event today. You can continue to explore the complete 2020 and 2021 SRHR index grades. Uh, you can see a snapshot of all of the SRHR index grades from 2016 through to 2021. Um, and then there's the new SRHR index summary uh, on a link in the chat. With that, I will wrap everything up. Thank you again for having me. I'm Jess Jacobs. This was an absolutely wonderful morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world to get to spend with all of you. So have a beautiful, beautiful day and, uh, and here's to more work together. Thank you. Thanks all.